happening, first of all, I said there were three factors. One of them is that it's happening within a cosmic time frame. And the cosmic time frame doesn't guarantee that anything is going to happen. But in the last age, in the last years of Kali Yuga, an ancient teaching says that in the last centuries of Kali Yuga, when we are living now, that is the time when humanity as a whole reaches its worst state of degeneration, absurdis absurdity, stupidity, violence, and oblivion. And we sure can see it, uh, John. And we, we sure are there. At the same time, because there's a double message about Kali Yuga. Mm. The other thing that the Maharnavana Tantra says is that even though the great mass of humanity descends into degeneration, this is the time for the highest opportunity for spiritual development in the shortest period of time. Hmm. And, and so this amplification, this opportunity for very rapid, fast-track spiritual development and fast-track acquisition of shamanic and magical powers by our species uniquely occurs in this timing. That's one reason as far as the cosmic time, rate, time frame is concerned. So now let me see if I can give you very briefly what the other two reasons are. Mm -hmm. The other two reasons why it's happening now is, first of all, that humanity is organized in such a way psychically, the human being is organized in such a way psychically that we have had to go to the worst case scenario for our species before we could break into the secret of our divine experiment. This is not going to end in a nightmare. This is not going to end in a doomsday scenario. But we had to go to the point where it would almost be so. Where that threat would actually be looming on the horizon in order to be in enough shock to be woken up. Mm. You know, Kali, who rules over this period of time, which is exceptional degeneration and exceptional advance, is the shock goddess. She awakens us by shock. And so we have to be shocked by the prospect of a nightmare of our own making in order to wake up and seize the true potential for this divine experiment. So that's another factor that's leading us to this moment. And then there's the third factor. And the third factor is Gaia herself. The living, animating, sublime, indwelling consciousness of this planet is like the consciousness of an animal. She's an animal. Think of Gaia as an animal. You know, Gaia has been, is a name taken from science, from the Gaia hypothesis of Lynn Margulis and James Lovelock. Mm. And I've talked a lot about the guy hypothesis in my book, Not in His Image, because it's very compatible with the Gnostic vision of Sophia. Therefore, I coined this joint term, Gaia Sophia, to bring those two things together. Now, I want to point out that it would be a very good practice from here on, as well as thinking of the planet as a superorganism, which is what Lynn Margulis calls it. Well, as well as realizing that the planet is alive, it's in a living being, it's not a dead lump of matter. Think of it as an animal. And I call that animal Pam. You can call her Pam if you want to. P-A-M. <laughs> Planetary Animal Mother. Right. So, so call her Pam. Pamela, Pam for short, yeah? Yeah, Pam for short, right? Pam. Call her Pam. Pam is waking up. <laughs> now, Pam is like a big big lion. She's a very ferocious animal, very protective of her progeny. And this is the moment when Gaia awakens. That's why I called my framework for planetary tantra the terma of Gaia awakening. This is the moment when she awakens. And when she awakens to the plight of humanity, and we, humanity, awaken to our plight, and then to her presence as a living divine animal, then it's a whole new game. That is the shift. And the shift is now. I'm not talking 
Henrik about things that are going to happen here mm. in this whole interview. I'm not talking about things that are going to happen. I do not predict. I'm talking about what is happening. This is happening now. She is awakening and she is making her awakened presence available to every single human being who can bring themselves to it. And planetary tantra is, and it's a very simple practice, it's not complicated, it's not hierarchical, it's not a new religion, it's not a cult, I'm not trying to start a cult. Planetary tantra is the simple practice by which each individual can bring themselves to her living presence and make this connection one person at a time. And this is the great opportunity that is now unfolding. Is this a window of opportunity or is it kind of from now on and, and, and forward as we go? It is a window that is open from now on. It's not a window that's going to close. It's like an aperture, Henrik. Hmm. It's like the aperture of a lens opening to a portal for humanity to enter. And in that portal is the meeting with the goddess and the interactivity with the earth and the continuation, the, res the restoration of the divine experiment according to her terms. Because she is a divine being who conceived the human species. This is what the Gnostic myth says. And so she also conceived a certain experiment for us. And when we can interact actually with her intelligence and know what that is, then we are really on the on the proper path for our species. So we, humanity, are, are the progeny that you talked about earlier, her, her protective tendencies, if you will, then are for us, uh, John. Well, for all species, for all species. She has a fiercely protective uh, sense for all the living species of the Earth, and uh, uh, she, you know, if she sees them endangered, she will respond. But there is a particular role that we play, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of taken a, a chance uh, in my in latest writings on MedHistory Orb, Orb to say, well, let's call ourselves her pet species, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I've taken a chance, I just want to play with that, don't take it too seriously, but I want to qualify that it doesn't mean that humanity, being the pet species of the goddess, is any better than any other of her species, whether they be beavers or bears or whales or beetles. But it means that we have some exceptional role in her dream, in her eonic divine plan for an experiment. We play some exceptional role. And so her protective tendencies are certainly very strong in regard to the human species. And she's coming out with measures and uh, to protect us and and uh, these are not things I've invented these are things that I can describe and everyone can verify them by their own experiences we we do hold a different consciousness obviously than than uh, the animals yeah. do in one way or another I mean we could even see it when we look around if nothing else John it's we can definitely see it because of our dis connection to many of the things, uh, unlike most of the animals and, and in nature, there's a whole different set of uh, connectivity, if you will. But we, are, we we can see through simple observation that we are separate or different from that. Yeah, the disconnection is, is, a, 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 is an, a disadvantage or a risk that we face because we carry exceptional faculties that other animals don't, don't carry. Right. You see, when Sophia acting from the pleuromic center, engineered the human genome, the human genomic design, which is called the anthropos. She conceived it as possessing certain faculties, certain capacities, which are metanoia, dianoia, nous, epinoia, other faculties like this, which are capac noetic capacities of our species, intellectual capacities, which other animals don't have. One of them is obviously the capacity for language and for complex symbol systems. Another marked capacity of humanity, which makes us exceptional but not superior, is that we can extrapolate and plan and model things. You know, beavers can build a dam, and that takes a certain amount of beaver genius, and it's a marvelous thing, but we can build fantastic bridges. And in order to build a fantastic bridge, which beavers couldn't build, we have to preconceive that bridge and preconceive the steps of constructing it, right? That's right. 
Well, that is one of the gifts of our species. It's called modeling and, and then uh, putting into application what we've modeled. But the problem with that, there's also a great drawback with that, and that is that we can model things and simulate things and get more interested in modeling than in reality, and we can get lost in our concepts and in our simulations. And the Gnostics warned about that, because when we get lost in our models and our simulations, when we get lost in playing with the tools rather than in using them, we become subject to this archontic deviance, and that's when we really go off the track. So in a way, one of our highest gifts, which is language and symbol making and modeling, is also carries certain risks that yeah, other animals don't get. Yeah. That's right. It's the, the curse and the gift all kind of wrapped into one. Would this also explain, you think, uh, aspects like, uh, you know, our collective neurosis, our sense of trauma, hysteria, and even schizophrenia that human, mankind seem to suffer from, uh, John? Well, yeah, the, the basis of that largely is that when we make models, uh, and when we make culture and when we, uh, we, uh, we construct things abstractly and we construct language systems and we use codes, we become so fascinated with these that it, it subtly over a period of time takes our attention away from our source, which is nature. You know, no matter what models we can build, there is no model superior to the models of nature itself. That's right. I mean, all our inspiration comes from nature pretty much when it comes to uh, it should. the zipper. It should, the but unfortunately, to the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it should. But unfortunately, a lot of it leads us away from nature into a self-referential maze mm. of our own thinking and of our own abstraction. And when that happens, we do become insecure, paranoid, and erotic because we have lost contact with our source. We've lost contact with the source of life, which is the planet, not just the physical planet, but the, the, the living and divine intelligence of the planet. Mm. And so we've lost our way and we wander into narcissism and then we wander into psychosis and this is basically where we go. We can't go much further in that direction. <laughs> That's right. So um, how do we tie this together a little bit uh, then, uh, John? The, the, the concept here, obviously. Oh, wait, there was one more thing I want to ask you about, actually. It sure. had to do with the, the mythology, if you will, then, of the, the, the Sophia myth. Um, why sure. basically it was left open-ended, and if that was for a reason, because that obviously makes it very different than uh, other mythologies out there. You could even argue that we sh it, it falls into a different cat category than a, myth a mythology, then, in one sense. Oh, it's not only in a different category, it's, it's incomparable. The, the Sophia myth is incomparable for two reasons, and I've, and I've often pointed this out. First of all, because it is the only complete, coherent myth we have that describes our origin as a human species and the evolution of the earth, the conditions of the solar system, and many, many other things. It is the myth for our species, just as each tribe, indigenous tribes in, in Australia or, or Africa or the Arctic, each had a myth of origin for that tribe the human species has its myth of origin, and this is it. So it's it's of paramount importance. And second of all, it's left open-ended, which makes it a participatory myth, technically speaking. Mm. And the reason why it's left open-ended by the Gnostics is, first of all, because they did